Hello, my name is Brian Widener. I'm an assistant professor of music education at Butler University. I'm Becca Manson. I'm a sophomore music education major at Butler University. So um, Becca is one of my students here, and as you may notice, um, she has a unique set of um, abilities going on within um, her time here at Butler, and we're going to be talking about how we've confronted issues of ableism within our music education curriculum as part of that. Um, I do want to leave right up front. We will be using the phrase disabled person as opposed to person with disabilities uh, by Becca's preference, which she'll explain a little later in this presentation. Uh, but just I wanted to put that up front as I know there is an active discussion around how we refer to disabled people. And that's the way that we'll be doing it throughout this presentation. When we look at prior uh, research that has been looking at ableism in higher education in general, um, we have found that many of these have been um, focused in specific programs or personal experiences with ableism. When we look at ableism within collegiate music, um, there is a recognition that ableism is very widespread, largely due to strong assumptions of ability and discriminatory, discriminatory practices um, against, uh, or within, I should say, different traditions and different functions of music making. Um, when we look at music education, we find that we are a very able-bodied, ably capable um, profession where um, ability difference has largely been discouraged, um, both intentionally and implicitly, and that there is a tacit reception of ableism as just being part of what it means to be a musician. In essence, we, whether we're looking at the way instruments are handled and utilized, to the way music is made, there is an expectation of how the body looks, how we move, and how we engage with that music making. Within this study, our primary focus was on coming to understand what Becca's experiences have been as a disabled person within a music education program, and likewise, what that program's response has been um, to being able to accommodate, and as we're gonna talk, make music education accessible uh, to a disabled student. So this is a critical case study, um, and throughout it, um, we used a range of narrative techniques to gather stories and experiences, as well as the embedded experience of both of us as participant researchers in this. This included interviews uh, with uh, Becca on multiple occasions, as well as faculty and staff across the university about their personal experiences with ability and with Becca. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that participant pool in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, it's really important you get to know who Becca is. So I'm Becca. I'm 20 years old, and I'm a sophomore music ed student here at Butler, as I've already told you, um, for a bit of background about me. So I grew up in foster care, and growing up, my main disability was that I'm hard of hearing. Um, I essentially had no other disabilities, uh, and I, when I came into uh, college here at Butler, those were going to be our biggest concerns. Um, about two weeks into uh, my very first semester here at Butler, I passed out on the floor of my dorm room and I essentially woke up a right-sided hemiplegic. What that means is if you draw a straight line down my entire body, the right side doesn't work. That includes my right leg, hence why I'm not able to walk, and my right hand. Um, since then, I actually took the semester off, came back in the spring semester, and I've also been diagnosed with a slew of other life-threatening diseases. Uh, to try and emphasize the sheer volume of this, uh, one of my diseases, there's only about 50,000 people in the world with it. And um, one big thing for me this summer was that I completed a course of treatment that made me the only the eighth person in the world um, to see this type of progress. So that's also why I'm wearing a number eight t-shirt um, in the picture because I'm the eighth person to be successfully treated. Rather than have Becca brag about herself, one of the things that absolutely came up um, in every discussion that I've had are some of the character traits that have made working with Becca um, and recognizing what it means to be a disabled person in our university and our program clear. Um, she is tremendously transparent and honest about her condition and her needs. Um, due to her experiences in foster care, she has been forced to be a personal advocate and that has come into play as we've talked about ability. Um, at the same time, um, despite um, the disabilities she has, she has a very strong desire to be independent and she has a way of being independent um, in just about everything. Um, but I think first and foremost, she is just a tenacious, gregarious human being that others immediately want to engage with and others are drawn to her. Uh, to share a perspective on that, I'd like to share the words of our director of bands and Becca's euphonium teacher, 
uh, Mike Colburn, who talks a little bit about his experiences with Becca. She, she's not a complainer by nature. She doesn't like special treatment, but but she acknowledges, okay, I, I, I need help, you know, accessing these buildings and, and, and doing these things. So um, seeing that quality in her made me even more sensitive to, okay, so what, what can we do? What should we do to allow Becca to have as full of an experience here as possible? So Mike is just one part of our professional team that have been talking regularly, formally and informally, um, about Becca. Um, at the very front end are her, the faculty members that work alongside her. And um, we have a list there of those who have been an intimate part of this experience. In order to make it so that the faculty can do our jobs, it's also required a slew of communication from administration and service uh, portions of our university. Um, and many of these people have been involved in the interview process um, for this study as well. There is a third group that is also part of this ongoing circle, which are not immediately part of this study due to IRB concerns, um, but are absolutely part of the communication circles and the dialogue that we're going to talk about, which are the friends that Becca has around her who work steadfastly to be great human beings and great friends alongside her, but also addresses her experience as a disabled person here. So in the time that remains, we're gonna be talking about four major themes um, around accessibility, around identity and ability, around dialogue, and ultimately the impact on the university of Becca's experiences here. And it's critically important that we start at that position of identity and ability, um, recognizing that in even using the word disabled person, we are applying a certain identity to this and what we've come to see is this idea of ability as a social construct, which Becca is going to talk about. So to me, I view disability as a social construct. So a primary, I'm gonna explain this via an example. So I'm hard of hearing. For the purposes of this discussion, I don't typically say that I have a hearing impairment. I don't feel that that's appropriate language, but for this discussion, I will. So I have a hearing impairment. Physically, I cannot hear well, as well as another person. I can do anything with my impairment in the context of a music educational setting. I can do oral skills, I can do theory, I can play an instrument, I can tune, I can do all of these things. And my hearing impairment, is, I can do it both despite of and because of my hearing impairment. I would argue that not only is it this impairment, but it also gives me a lot of advantages. Um, and so I can do anything with my impairment, but what makes it a disability? What makes it something that's negative? What makes it something that hurts me? And the reality is it's not it in and of itself. It's the attitudes, actions, and beliefs that other people have with regards to this thing. It's the fact that even though I can do oral skills, that I can tune, that I can play an instrument, other people say, well, I don't think you can do this or I don't think you can do this properly. And just because I need to do it differently doesn't mean I can't do it. It means just that, that I need to do it differently. It's not a disability until society makes it one because I can do anything regardless of my disability. And to that effect, I want, also want to talk a little bit about why I prefer the term disabled person over person with a disability. Um, so we have two terms. We have person with a disability and we have disabled person. Person with a disability is you need to see me and you need to not see any of my disability. You need to just see me. Disabled person is typically associated with you need to see the wheelchair and you need to not see me. Both of these have great noble intentions. With that said, you have to see both. The reason being is if all we see is me as a person and we don't see my wheelchair, then we are neglecting a fundamental part of my identity. This wheelchair to me is not an accessory that I carry. It's not something that I put down at the end of the day or choose not to care about or that doesn't affect me. It is an integral part of me. And when we fail to acknowledge this integral part of me, we fail to give me what I need. Because the reality is as much as I want you to see me a person, you cannot deny that I'm in a wheelchair because there's things I need as a result of that. I am a disabled person. My disability is not something that is negative. It is not a bad thing. It is a part of me. And honestly, if you have to say person with a disability in order to see me as a person, then you didn't see me as a person in the first place. This idea of seeing the person and the ability at the same time, um, ran through a lot of the discussions. And I'd like to introduce Jeff Gillespie, who is our coordinator of music theory, who's worked very closely with Beck and understand 
um, what it means for Becca to be in our music theory and oral skills curriculum. As far as evaluating, I mean, my goal was to, to figure out what she can do, what she can hear, what she already knows. Um, I feel like initially uh, she didn't know what she could do. It seemed like she wasn't real confident about her hearing mm -hmm. or didn't think she could hear much of anything. Right. And so uh, my initial goal was to first of all find out what she could hear and be positive. Right. You can do this, you can do this, you can do that. Um, and let's make a list yeah. so that she's aware of what she's able to do already. I don't anticipate any problems whatsoever as long as we do our job <laughs> and pay attention and communicate. And if there's something that's not working, we need to figure out a way to make it work. We do, not hers. One of Becca's core area teachers, uh, Kyle Furlane, brought his background in philosophy into play in talking about this and looking at the concept of a dilemma of difference. Essentially, how do we see the person if we don't see um, the differences that they have there? And I think he speaks to that very eloquently here. How can we use those um, to like elevate people's experience and not, uh, again, not be this like, oh, I have these conditions, so I can't do X, Y, and Z. It's kind of like, do you want to do X, Y, and Z? We will figure out a way to do that. This subtle shift from saying you can't do this to presuming that we can do this underlines a lot, underlies a lot of what we talk about in um, education in general regarding universal design. And uh, Becky Marsh, one of our music education professors, um, discussed that in her relationship with designing a class um, to meet Mecca's needs along with those of every other student in the classroom. You're thinking, person, who are the people in my room before mm -hmm. I care at all the what of what I'm teaching? Mm -hmm. And you pair that with, when you think about the what, a universal design approach to that, then Becca is just another student in the class who needs you have to meet or whose successes you want to celebrate or whose strengths or weaknesses mm -hmm. you're going to meet. So when we start looking at the perspectives of our faculty who are open to recognizing that needs are present in all of us that is part of our identity, it opens up a space in which we can have a critical dialogue uh, between students, faculty, staff, peers, and others about how we support every student. And for us, that has become something that um, we have affectionately termed the process. And I'm going to ask Becca to talk you through that. Yeah, so essentially what happens with what we call the process um, is first I want to say this system was built after resistance. It's something that, like, we had had issues with professors, um, and we had sat down and said, okay, how do we think we can fix this? So the very first thing that we do is when we talk about my courses and we talk about my faculty, we specifically try to f locate faculty and courses that we think will be compatible with me and my unique needs, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a fundamental part of how we make sure that this works for me. So then the first thing that we do is they'll get my accommodations letter. Basically, I mean, it's purposely vague. It's a giant list of all the things that they legally have to do because I'm a student in their classroom. And frankly, it doesn't tell them much about why they're doing it or about who I am. And no, I'm not legally required to tell them that, but I choose to in the process. So the first thing we do after they receive that accommodation letter is I sit down and I talk with that faculty member and I basically say, Hi, I'm Becca, and this is me. And I give them a synopsis, sort of like what I gave you at the beginning, but with a bit more detail relevant to their class. Um, and I explain, this is why I need the accommodations I do. For example, an attendance accommodation. This is why I would miss class. This is how I will make sure that I'm communicating with you when I miss class. These are situations in which I might not be able to communicate with you. And I really just lay it out there so that they can better understand me before we even step into a classroom. So then after that, Dr. Widener sits down and um, is really a linchpin in all of this in terms of reiterating the things that I say. Because as a student, I only have so much weight. Dr. Widener is able to come in and say, as her advisor, I can reiterate what she's saying and I can explain further that this is how we do these things. Um, he can say this is what has worked in the past in a way that I necessarily can't, can't necessarily. 
and he says these are things that we can do to better support Becca. And he also serves as like, if as things come up, he's a great resource for me and for my faculty to say, hey, what has worked and what hasn't. And once that is established, this now becomes a two-way discussion, and uh, more than two-way, as it's the faculty members to Becca, Becca to me, me to the faculty members, to try to find solutions that work through. Um, Becky Marsh talks about this from her experiences of having gone through um, the process and how it improved the experience in working with Becca in the classroom. I felt comfortable asking her questions because you had said Becca's totally comfortable to talk about XYZ. Mm -hmm. Um, so just asking, hey, like, tell me about you. Nice to meet you. Here's class. Here's some of the things. What do you think you might need? What questions do you have? Do you anticipate, like, are there things that have gone well with other faculty members? Like, what am I probably going to suck at? Also, let me tell you, I'm going to suck at some stuff mm -hmm. when it comes to making sure that you have what you need. So just tell me. You won't hurt my feelings. And let's just check in. So importantly, once that relationship is established, we came to realize the importance of including um, Becca's peer group in this conversation. And obviously there are parts that aren't shared, which is again that key linchpin of having Becca and myself at the center of this, of being able to control what that dialogue is, but also recognizing that her friends need reassurance and that there's information that they have that can help support the larger circle. All the way down to so-and-so's class isn't working for Becca, you should probably talk to Becca about that. Um, and building that forward. Um, our director of our School of Music has been very involved in this, um, and David Murray talks a little bit about the importance of building um, that person at the center of this conversation. So it's finding the right student mentor for any you know future students yeah. that we have. Yeah. Um, and also making sure that we know maybe who the faculty member, whether it's an advisor or applied teacher or classroom teacher, that that particular student really feels most comfortable communicating with and support that relationship. Our administration has been a key part of this entire systemic engagement um, with Becca as a disabled student in our program of opening up opportunities for our support services and making sure that this is an ongoing and constant dialogue. Um, this is not something that one person carries, but rather this idea of constant communication back and forth of what is possible and what's needed. Those support services then are certainly for Becca, but recognizing that a fair chunk of that support time is also being given to faculty, to her advisors, to her friends, of coming to understand how we can serve to make sure that Becca's experience here is as full and accessible and complete as any other student. Um, and it's having that constant and honest discussion, not once a month, not once a year, but rather having those open doors that allow us to come in and out um, a really good example of this dealt with a housing issue that we had, and that um, I had spoken with our dean, Lisa Brooks, on this, who then carried it through the university, and she talks a little bit about how you can see this process play out in real time. And then when I got back, I think then you had shared some of the legal stuff, and I wrote to him, and I said, you asked me what we could do. We need to get her housing. We need to get her something that we can do. And of course, he doesn't know how to do those things, but he was able to connect me. He said, let's bring Melissa Smearden in, let's talk about, let's see what we can do. And kind of with his stamp, kind of got to. And so, then when I got back, I think they, and then when. So officially this conversation starts in our student disabilities office with an accommodations list. And Becca very proudly carries the largest accommodations list of any student. This is literally what every faculty member gets. And it's a good start spot to start the discussion, but it's recognizing that to have real change happen, we have to go beyond just accommodation and instead have to start asking the question about accessibility. And this has become our primary concern of not how can we accommodate Becca's special needs, but rather how can we make sure that everything that we do is truly accessible? Um, I'll give the example of the Brass Techniques class, which I teach right now. There are certain elements of that class that are difficult, if not impossible, for Becca to be able to do right now with limited right side mobility. Um, handling a tuba is one that we're negotiating at the moment, but it's recognizing that um, in order to go through the class, we have specific exercises that are part of it, but is the exercise the important part or is it the underlying technique? Is it the pedagogy that we're coming to understand? So this idea of moving towards accessibility 
instead of accommodation becomes really important. What are our performance assumptions? What does it mean to be a music teacher? Can we model with disability? Um, are, and can we find opportunities that allow Becca to get the key technical and the key pedagogical elements, such as being able to find her way around a drum set with really limited mobility on the right side of her body? Um, our director of student disability services talks about this um, and really carefully considering what we consider our essential learning. So I'll turn it to Kathleen Kamiri. I think one thing that a lot of um, institutions of higher education and uh, faculty tend to try to lean towards is we want to prepare them for what the expectations will be in XYZ profession. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that cannot be your bar for assessment in a course. We are not graduating them based on their ability to meet the expectations of a particular job. We are graduating them based on the expectations of being able of being able to meet the expectations of a particular degree program, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's really important to lean on and and carefully review your syllabus um, essential elements and learning objectives and like what is essential and really looking into like why is it essential. So all of these aspects of identity and access really come together in recognizing that coming up with understanding of accessibility is much more multidimensional than just what does Becca need academically? What does Becca need in terms of fundamentals? But it includes all of those. Our ME 102 course um, served as a really primary space for us to explore these um, as we take an identity-based approach to music teacher education. And I'm gonna ask Becca to share one of those experiences that she had that was really key in looking at issues of accessibility matched with those of identity. Yeah, so basically in ME 102, we spent a lot of time talking about like, what is your identity and what are our students' identities and how do we kind of navigate those? Um, and so in my experience, there was a lot of awkwardness around me being in a wheelchair. Um, I'd also come halfway through the year, which complicated matters, um, but people felt very awkward around me. And at one point in February, Dr. Marsh approached me um, and said, hey, Becca, like, to be honest, I've noticed that everybody feels a bit awkward. And I was like, glad to hear we're on the same page. And over the course of our conversation, we came to the conclusion, I was comfortable with this. Um, a lot of disabled students won't be comfortable with this, but I personally was, uh, that I was going to essentially introduce myself to the class and sort of explain, hi, this is me. I know we're all wondering like why I'm in a wheelchair. Here's why I'm in a wheelchair. And let's talk about how you can interact with me. So then the next day we went into ME 102 um, and I said, basically the motto for my conversation at that point was just ask. Everybody felt really weird because they didn't know, do I hold the door open? Do I grab this for you? Do I step up and help you at this point? And what I told them is just ask me. I'm just like any one of you. I'm just as capable. I am just as capable and just as, yeah, just as capable as any of the rest of you. So just ask me if there's something that I need and I'll happily answer the question. Um, and I certainly opened myself up to pretty much ask me anything. That's something that, once again, I was comfortable with, not all disabled people will be comfortable with. And I did warn them, there's gonna be times when I say like, hey, here's the answer to that question. But by the way, this probably isn't a great question to ask somebody else that you maybe meet on the street with a disability. Um, and so then at that point, um, Dr. Marsh asked if anyone had any questions and it turned into a class of like us talking about and then just asking all the questions that really they wanted to ask me that would help them feel comfortable with me because they hadn't really had extensive interactions with a person in a wheelchair. And so from there, I certainly noticed a shift. There was a lot of before it was super awkward and then now they're very, hey, do you need help with that or do you not need help with that? Hey, I noticed that that was sort of ableist. And we have those discussions and we have that open dialogue and they've become some of my biggest friends and supporters. A key thing for all of us educationally has been feeling okay about the fact that we're working towards improvement and not perfection. This has been a very twisty path to finding answers. Um, it's been a lot of trial and error. But kind of the underlying piece is this goal of getting better and not needing to be perfect. Importantly, one of the things that Becca emphasized was that she did not want to be sheltered because of her disability. She didn't want to be told this is something you can't do, but rather being given that opportunity to try, 
that opportunity for us to go, that didn't work. And recognition that some of our best efforts aren't going to meet Becca's needs, but that there is a spirit in place of constant and ongoing improvement. So when we look at the larger uh, university, you may be asking, what is actually the benefit um, for the university? And I think most importantly, um, by having Becca as part of our community, it upholds the belief that all students are truly deserving of high quality education, which we can't understand unless all students are truly present, uh, as stated by our Associate Dean, Wendy Meaden. We talk about the Butler Way and wanting to make an impact in the world, and I hope that we will continue to give strong consideration to students of all abilities. And just as we have known for a long time that you don't learn to understand diversity until you live with it, I think this needs to be a part of that because our, our differently abled students are few and far between. So through Becca's eyes, we've come to understand what ability-based diversity actually means, and it's becoming bit by bit normalized. There's a wholesale reconsideration of our facilities, of our curriculum, of our scheduling and our support. The video that's playing right now is one that was sent along to our university president to capture what a day in the life is for Becca. And the response was immediate of making changes to our facilities to allow for accessibility. The systematization of offering help and moving from a model of accommodation to accessibility has been critically important in ensuring that Becca not only is capable of being here, but that the complete curriculum of our program is truly accessible to her. And I'll admit, we're still in the works of getting to that point of true accessibility. It's a work in progress. So our time here is up, but we really encourage you to please join us afterwards um, for a, a, at the Zoom link, essentially our hallway chat afterwards. We'd love to hear your questions and your concerns. Uh, likewise, feel welcome to reach out to me if there are questions specific to Becca. I will happily pass those along and allow her to answer them. Um, and I think we have a couple of minutes perhaps maybe left um, to be able to discuss further. Thank you so much for your time here today. And uh, we're open to questions. Have a good day.